train them that well that you it doesn't lead to any disasters like wrong drug infusion. Sometimes patients have been killed by such mistakes. Initially, when you start or you set up a service, it's important that you support such staff. You'll have to be present physically there or your residents, someone should be there to help them and motivate them. Well, we have uh, acute care nurses, acute pain nurses in Western system in you, sorry, in the UK or the US. But here, if we cannot afford those, we'll have to train maybe our existing staff to take on those enhanced roles. And numbers of staff, if you have more, say, block room set up or anyway, you might even need more staff. Well, uh, we've got all, all S's on board now. So we are working around patient. So that is, again, last, as I said, not the, the least. We should make sure that though we are oriented towards regional anesthesia, we don't push patients for regional anesthesia. We respect their autonomy, maintain safety, monitoring standards, lab resuscitation equipment uh, to ensure their safety, and inform choice by giving them all risks and benefits. Right, if everything is together, the system is going to work. And the good example is, again, Canadian, the Holland uh, Orthopedic and Arthritic Center, who converted to regional within just two years and uh, increased their uh, uh, rate of peripheral nerve blocks from zero to 95%. So the conclusion is we have to challenge the status quo, create a conducive and seamless ecosystem for sustained impact and have to be very creative and proactive. Thank you. I think I'll invite uh, comments from uh, our co-chairman here, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, who set up so many systems uh, and, and still um, not tired of them. So if, if you've got um, something to say, please. Way back in 1960s, John Bonica, in his operating suit, had one room kept for region. Any patient coming to that room will have only a regional anesthetic. The anesthetic machine he kept covered so that nobody can use the anesthesia machine. So this is one beginning. And he really oriented the surgeons that there is something called region anesthesia which is also beneficial, etc., etc. And that is what we are practicing today. And I'm, I'm very glad that she brought up this topic. This is not discussed, particularly when we are operating in the institutions. Then we don't realize the problems which can happen in uh, private sectors. And I'm sure with the dynamic people like Priti, but one point is that I do not agree with her. The anesthetist in India has not taken the vaccine. Please. <laughs> Just a minute. So I sum up that this is a very good idea, how to motivate. This is total in conformation with the recent techniques of managerial concerns. You become a good manager for regional, you can use it in your practice. Become a good manager. And I know surgeons, many a times they call, please get that gentleman, he is so good. Or we get that lady, she is so good in this. And recently I was in Singapore, just one, one minute. The chief of orthopedic surgeon's wife was getting a knee replacement. So he didn't operate. He brought another chief from another hospital. And that gentleman said, I like to have my own guy from my hospital because he gives such beautiful blocks. And this is what we want to achieve. Everybody, the patients will start killing. That person gives such a good to make it rural and easy for labor. Go to that hospital. We are in the front seat. Who said we are in the back seat? Yes, Chamu. Uh, I just you said what I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. Any more questions, please? So I would also like to thank Dr. saying that pain nurses are there in the US and UK and India in Delhi. We are running our acute pain services with pain nurses. Yes, yes, yes. I know at least Gandharam we started. Yes, one of the oldest departments, we started paying the nurses. We paid from our pocket, by the way, for the nurses, the administration did not. We shared the consumptions. Any other questions? 
So I think uh, everything good must come to an end. We are already cross and that lady is now smiling at last. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> and uh, so I must say that how uh, happy I am to share the dais with these two luminaries, and how happy I am to share the hall with you people. Such wonderful things I learned today from your questions. to be Dr. Santil uh, Sadashivan from the US. He's going to speak on expert opinion for adapters to, to remote locations in infants and children. Uh, and request Dr. Yeah. Thank you uh, for the invitation. And uh, so I have a little gathered room, that's why I'd like to go first. And you can ask me a question right after my lecture. And uh, well, I appreciate you coming. And uh, I have a couple of questions. How many uh, of you do pediatric at the U.S.? Okay. How many of you do uh, a cardinal cat? Just one. Good. Good. So uh, I'll, I'll be talking more about uh, simple cardinals, cardinal catheters, and overall epidural uh, analgesia after surgery. And uh, so uh, we all know the benefits of uh, epidural. So overall, my, my lecture would. Uh, uh, focus on the benefits of uh, epidural, especially in uh, neonates, infants, and children, and general principles, how epidural analgesia is different from, uh, say, adult uh, epidural analgesia, then some of the uh, differences, major differences between pediatric and uh, adult uh, epidural analgesia. So uh, techniques, uh, needles, chapters, and the drugs we use for pediatric epidural analgesia. Some of the safety and outcome uh, differences. So the benefits of uh, epidural analgesia is not different uh, in children, except uh, children are at high risk for respiratory depression from opioid. That's why we uh, preferentially use uh, epidural analgesia whenever possible, cardinal analgesia whenever possible, to decrease the use of opioids. And also we see a lot faster uh, recovery, uh, in, especially in children, a better quality analgesia, since they cannot, uh, children cannot uh, say complain of pain, and we have assume a lot, so uh, it provides better pain control. Uh, after even outpatient surgery. Uh, we follow all our epidural patients for at least uh, three, four days, and we leave catheters for uh, up to uh, even seven days if needed. And we see uh, the immediate after surgery, especially abdominal surgery, uh, uh, it's a lot shorter whenever we use uh, epidural analgesia. Then uh, we also see uh, improved uh, tissue perfusion and less infection. There are uh, recent reports that whenever we use epidural for uh, even lower extreme surgeries, the chance of infection, single site infection, are a lot less. So uh, that's another benefit. <coughs> even uh, uh, there's an adult report, not in pediatric literature, uh, recurrence of uh, uh, the tumors and tumor metastasis is seem to be low, and where we use epidural analgesia compared to, uh, say, TCA with the opioid analgesia. And the early extubation and the early discharge from hospital is obviously a big advantage. And less inflammation uh, is well proven and less uh, stress response. Less thromboembolic events uh, and uh, less blood loss during surgery, especially if it is placed before surgery and continued uh, throat pain drop period. We talked about uh, opioid sparing effects, and especially in uh, neonates and preterm babies, uh, 
we, we do uh, for uh, epidurals, especially caudal and continuous uh, epidural catheters. Uh, for CDH repairs, percutaneous epidural fistula, manual diaphragmatic hernia patients, they all uh, sometimes have chest tubes. Whenever we do uh, an epidural, uh, they need a lot less opioids. After we remove the epidural, after chest tube removal, these patients go uh, straight to oral, stillness, and paracetamol. And uh, so uh, we, we have significant opioid sparing effects and uh, with epidural, so we like that, especially for respiratory depression and uh, decreased uh, sedation in these services. So, but the general principle, uh, before we do any uh, pediatric epidural, so we had to uh, get, uh, say, good experience with adult epidurals. So as uh, Karmaker and uh, Sean Fleck talked about, uh, sonar anatomy of um, uh, neuro access yesterday. So we had familiarized ourselves with adult uh, epidurals and sonar anatomy of neuro access before we try in children, especially in uh, animal uh, So neonates, preterm babies, and, and infants. And uh, so we had also uh, know the anatomical differences between adults and uh, children. And uh, it's very superficial in children, even if they in neonates, especially uh, preterms, it will be less than one centimeter depth of so the epidural space. So uh, we have to be very careful uh, in placing uh, correct thoracic epidural, especially in, uh, in um, direct epidurals. And um, so that's why we do caudal epidurals in uh, the babies, especially less than six months of age. And uh, there are some uh, pharmacokinetic differences uh, so uh, children are at risk for, uh, say, central neuroaxial opioid related uh, respiratory depression and also uh, toxicity with the local anesthetics. And most importantly, children, we need to uh, frequently monitor and closely monitor uh, whether they have good pain relief, whether they develop any side effects from pain or epidurals. So we should also just focus on just analgesia, not full dense uh, anesthesia, especially for post op patients. So we have uh, some safer drugs, uh, so we uh, stopped using all other drugs, so we mainly use either chlorprocaine or uh, ropioacaine. And chlorprocaine, especially uh, for rescue uh, boluses, and if you had to do it, anything quick. And uh, so for uh, yesterday, we talked about compartment syndromes. If you had to decompress anything, the floor setting, and there's the big delay to get the patient to the uh, OR, we can use chlorprocaine, which it's very shorter acting uh, local anesthetic within uh, two minutes you will see uh, the benefit and uh, the relief and we can use that 50 percent that will provide good surgical anesthesia for patient type of uh, procedures and uh, we use uh, chlorprocaine in neonates uh, because shorter acting and also uh, it's a short living drug so uh, it doesn't uh, need uh, liver or kidney so it uh, needs uh, the plasma cholinesterase to metabolize it. So uh, that's the advantage of uh, chlorprocaine. So we use that in the neonates. And uh, the other drug we use is ropivacaine. Those two drugs are safer in children than uh, ropivacaine, uh, especially for cardiac toxicity. Then uh, the new technologies, uh, we use ultrasound. Uh, even if we don't use uh, real-time ultrasound to place uh, cardiac catheters, uh, we do measure uh, the pre-procedural, to do pre-procedural scanning to measure the depth of the epidurals, even in uh, some of the older kids. So uh, the differences between adults, uh, I, I think yesterday Sean Fleck and uh, uh, Manoj Karmaker talked a lot about that. So I'll skip a uh, couple of uh, slides since we are running late. So there are some uh, doubtful pharmacology related differences between children and adults. And uh, so as I mentioned, children are at high risk for local anesthetic toxicity and also from neuroxyl opioids. In our hospital, we stopped using epidural uh, opioids, especially as part of the continuous infusion. And we see a lot more uh, side effects, especially itching and uh, occasionally respiratory depression. So we do not do any, any more opioids in the epidural solutions. And um, so uh, in children, compared to adults, uh, the unbound drug uh, is more freely available. So results in higher toxicity, and especially uh, in uh, children less than two years of age. Uh, 
even more frequently in, in Mexico, that the dose we had cut back on the dose we get free drug is uh, more readily available than uh, neonates. And also, uh, children have uh, their weight, uh, they have higher uh, uh, cardiac output, so uh, the systemic absorption of local anesthetic is higher. So we had to uh, cut back on the dose just for the infants. And uh, elimination half-life is prolonged. That means uh, the elimination uh, is slow, so uh, the drug accumulates uh, because it's not eliminated easily, especially in less than one year of age. So, uh, and whenever we do epidural infusions, and we have to be very cognizant of uh, the dose, and we had to cut back on the dose. So you can see the systemic toxicity is at a lot lower level. Uh, in uh, children. So for respiratory is a 0.3 uh, micrograms per mol. For ropilocaine, it's a little bit better. So even though the, the dose for ropilocaine and uh, lupilocaine are about the same, so to cause significant toxins in ropilocaine, we had a higher level. That's why we like ropilocaine for its uh, safety compared to ropilocaine. <coughs> and uh, the reason for not using uh, epidural opioid, especially morphine and fentanyl in a drug, drugs are uh, because they achieve higher CSF level for a uh, given epidural dose compared to an adult. And also they have less uh, respiratory reserve, uh, especially in neonates and preterm infants. That's why we don't use opioids as part of the epidural solution in children. And uh, so we all know the indications of neuroactive anesthesia, caudal, the most common block is the dentor, everything below the uh, umbilicus and uh, very frequently uh, in most of the hospitals. And the epidural catheters, uh, I think pretty much similar indications uh, that includes the thoracic procedures as well and uh, abdominal procedures. Cardinal epidural catheters, typically we reserve that for infants and uh, neonates. So we frequently use cardinal catheters uh, only for um, neonates uh, and infants less than six months of age only for specific procedures. And uh, those are P, fistula, and uh, CDH, and genital diaphragmatic hernias, and uh, something called CPAM, so we, we see those cases very frequently, the congenital pulmonary adenomatoid malformation. So these patients uh, are uh, typically uh, two, three month old uh, uh, infants. Uh, they come for procedure, they postoperatively they will have chest tube. So what we do is uh, we place the caudal catheter with real time ultrasound guidance and uh, turn the catheter all the way to the thoracic level. Typically uh, T56 uh, or lower level. And uh, the distance in a typical three, four kilo uh, child from the caudal space to uh, thoracic space, if the catheter goes straight, it's about 15 centimeters. And if you see the 15 centimeter mark, uh, close to the insertion, insertion site, they are probably right at the thoracic level. And uh, we also uh, do a lot more caudals and epidurals for freedom uh, infants and uh, also for anemia. And because uh, they are prone to have <coughs> postoperative apnea, so we uh, do a lot more uh, blocks for those patients. Uh, also, those with uh, chronic pulmonary bronchopulmonary patients. You know the contraindications, similar to adults, and uh, sepsis, as absolute contraindications, severe coagulopathy, and uh, the related contraindications uh, to change depending on the condition. The needles, the caudal needles, uh, we use everything, and uh, we have 50 uh, different anesthesiologists. Uh, everybody would use different needle, and uh, the simplest one is the 21, 22 gauge, the hypodermic needle, and that's the cheapest. And uh, we have silent needles too, and uh, if you and the different. Uh, uh, Gauge, uh, epic two needles are available. Uh, so we, in our setup, we have uh, 17 to 19 gauge needles. So smaller uh, children would get 19 gauge. And uh, we also do a lot more adolescent procedures, including pectus with uh, thoracic epidural. So uh, those are um, uh, adult sized patients, so we use bigger needles for them. And also, we have stylated epidural catheters for caudal um, epidural catheters. So the one advantage of uh, the silent uh, epidural catheter compared to the regular epidural catheter is that it will keep the uh, catheter straight and so the threading of the catheter will be easier and uh, we can hope to uh, uh, thread the catheter easily into the thoracic level uh, with a little bit of ease. 
there's, there's one from Champion and one from Champion East. I can cause a little bit more damage. Uh, but we have not seen any, anything major. We have been using Saturn and Kepler for uh, at least 20 years. And Proto Block, I think everyone does it. Uh, I think I will skip a couple of slides. So we do for patient surgery, it provides it to 12 hours of pain relief. Sometimes we do a Proto Block with uh, morphine, uh, especially for a patient who would stay for 24 hours. So whenever we do morphine, uh, in the part of space, the main team will uh, follow these patients and make sure no one writes any additional uh, opioid and gives opioid to all these patients because of the risk of uh, respiratory depression. So for part of that, we said we use rubricane and plain rubricane. We don't even use uh, epinephrine in the solution. And uh, we start using uh, epinephrine containing solutions or even test those for part of because of uh, one case of uh, paraplegia uh, in a patient who had vascular malformation. So, and the risk of uh, using uh, epinephrine containing solution is very permanent. So, it's, it's a patient has vascular or compromised uh, spinal cord perfusion. That's why we don't use epinephrine containing solution at all for, uh, especially in uh, infants and uh, in children. And the dose, uh, typically one ml per kilo of 0.2% of the regain. We take, uh, yes, whenever uh, we don't use epinephrine, we may miss intravascular uh, placement of uh, say auto. So that happened uh, with us, and uh, especially with the uh four or five years ago. And so that's a, a risk we take, but we can easily manage uh, the intravascular injection and uh, with the intralipid. But if a child uh, gets uh, significant uh, ischemia of the spinal cord, uh, that's uh, almost uh, permanent. So that's why it's... So the cardinal morphine, uh, if you do, and that's, uh, we do only on inpatients, and we do 50 micrograms per kilo, and we also combine... Neurological injury, especially in children, uh, is a serious risk, and uh, because the structures are so superficial, and if you're not careful... Dr. Santil, please sum up in two minutes. Okay. It, it can uh, decrease uh, in, in, uh, injury. And I'll skip a couple of the continuous catheters uh, we do in infants. So there are a lot of advantages with ultrasound. Uh, I think uh, we saw a lot of pictures. I have a couple of pictures for uh, yeah, one particular picture. This is the sagittal section view. So uh, the probe is placed I, uh, at the lumbar level here. But you can place it at the thoracic level too. You can see the epidural catheter right there. And uh, this is a cross-sectional uh, view. You can see uh, the dura with this arrow and the epidural catheters here. We use that uh, real time to uh, third the catheters to thoracic level. And uh, one concern, we, we don't do all epidurals in children under anesthesia. So for thoracic epidurals, especially in older children, when we do pectus repair, we do awake. And there are a couple of reports of paraplegia uh, with the thoracic uh, epidurals, especially for pectus procedures. And clonidine, uh, in, in, instead of opioids, we use clonidine now because it provides the same benefit without the risk of opioid, including respiratory depression. The dose we do is one to two mics uh, if it's a single dose. For infusions, uh, we use one microgram per ml solution at 0.2 to 0.4 ml per hour. Uh, local anesthetic toxicity, and uh, uh, so besides ABC of managing uh, all uh, problems, uh, we do. Uh, 20% uh, interlipid, and this is the dose. I think uh, everyone is familiar with uh, the doses. And uh, I'll take questions if you have. Yes, Johnny. Yeah, so. Uh, for uh, in, in the past, before rapivacaine, uh, and we used to do a lot more chlorprocaine. So if you do chlorprocaine, we used to use a 1.5% solution at a rate of 0.2. Now it is rapivacaine, so uh, eh, no, no chlorprocaine anymore. There are a lot of studies with rapivacaine even in neonates, and uh, it shows that as long as you uh, cut back on the dose to, uh, say, um, 0.2 ml per kg, 
and uh, the dose of 0.125% uh, solution at 0.2 ml per kilo per, sorry, I'll start again. <laughs> the solution concentration is 0 0.125, and the rate is 0.2 ml per kg per hour. So if you do that, and it provides good pain relief, and we don't see any signs of any excitation, CNS excitation or anything with that dose. And we do a boluses every four hours. Uh, the bolus dose would be just half of uh, the rate. So if you are giving one ml uh, per kg, the do bolus dose would be 0.5. Uh, I have one, you know, opinion about yours. So you put in a catheter, total space to thoracic level in infants and small children, and you keep it there. How long is safe to keep it there? Number one. Yes. Number two. Next one says, is there any any effect of placement of catheter for a longer period on development of uh, CNS? Does it damage the nose? You know, there's a there's some concern being raised about this. Okay, so with the typical duration uh, is we leave for two to three days. Okay. So as soon as the chest tube is removed and we remove the epidural catheter, it, it, sometimes the, uh, the chest tube would come out on second day after surgery, so the especially thoracic surgery sometimes the first day. We don't have any major concerns uh, with the local anesthetic induced toxicity to the spinal cord in, in neonates. But on the other hand, if, whenever we use Local anesthetic to provide pain relief, we are cutting back on opioids. Lately, there are a lot of uh, concerns with uh, uh, anesthesia related and opioid related uh, CNS toxicity, and uh, so we are cutting back no, no, on. No, I'm not concerned about I'm about the presence of a foreign body, a catheter, okay. in the epidural space. There are nerves, no, no, development I, of CNS, you know. The nerves are, you know, they have to develop. Has there been any concern being placed in the legal form, yeah. we should not do this because it might be damaging the nerves in a in the development, uh, developing CNS. Okay, so uh, we, we don't have any concerns, at least there's no major study, okay. the long-term follow-up study to show that. So we continue to do, and we prefer to do uh, the caudal catheters and uh, leave a foreign body, at least for two, three days. Yeah. Anybody has a comment on this? The concern of placement of catheter for... Dr. Mahesh Arora is having concern about that PRAN study which has come. Okay. And in this, there are four case reports of Cauda Venus syndrome following use of epidural catheter in children. So that's why he was saying whether we should abandon this procedure because it doesn't help in the outcome, particularly in emergency situations. Now, re reports suggest that patients undergoing tracheostomy fistula, mm -hmm. diaphragm hernia, mm -hmm. and pyroxenosis, mm -hmm. if you use, use epidural versus patients with the fentanyl morphine infusions, mm -hmm. there's not much of benefit amongst the two. So ultimately, the, your topic was whether epidural, outcome, epidural anesthesia will help in the outcome or not. Still, we, it is disputed. Evidence suggests that in evidence situations, it doesn't help. That's, that's the latest scenario. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, these are all case reports, and the PRAN database doesn't collect uh, good quality data. They, they collect a lot of data, but uh, the quality of data collected in the PRAN database is not perfect. So, uh, and, uh, so it's not as good as a randomized controlled trial. So, Thank you very much, Dr. Sentin. Um, uh, we move on to the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Brushali. Rishali Pondi. Yes. She's from Mumbai and she's going to talk to us about moving away from the neuraxis. Yes. So it's good that we have the other one first. Yeah. yeah. So that we <laughs> I know, I know. It so now we can dwell on the um, peripheral nerve blocks in children. Just Dr. Uh, yes, it's a perfect sequence as she just said. Thank you everybody for being in this hall. Everything mostly suits for adults. The newer techniques that come out, the newer instruments that might be taken up, the newer drugs that come out usually are for adults. Children always come a little later, if at all they have to. As pediatric anesthesiologist, every now and then, you are, not every now and then, perhaps day in and day out, you're going to take care of kids. I strongly believe in the statement here, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its kids or children. Yes, 
We need to take care of them. And if, as anesthesiologists, it becomes our foremost responsibility to keep them safe. And secondly, as less in pain as possible. So that the entire process of surgery, from the admission to the discharge, becomes far more evangelizing to the entire family. The role of central neuroaxis blocks, and Phil has already spilled beans on that. It's immense. We know that. We are going to look at the disadvantages of it, and then we will also see why peripheral nerve blocks. We'll see the blocks practiced in kids, the trunk blocks, lower extremity blocks, upper extremity blocks, and limitations. As much as we can, we will rush through them. Uh, let's see, we'll spend more time on the block procedures if we could. Role of central neuroaxis, it's beautiful. It's one technique that fits most of the things, from the toe to above the umbilicus, even to the thorax. In very small kids, if you play with the concentrations and the volumes, if you keep your probe, you will see the drug ascending up as much as you want it to be by dilutions within limits of the milligram per kilogram dosages. It gives complete analgesia. Very rare that a child's epidural is patchy or a caudal block is patchy. Well, so these are the benefits. Disadvantages? I agree, not too much in kids, but yes, a bit of hypertension, urinary retention because a child may not be in pain but does get irritable because of that, unnecessary anesthesia on the operated part of the body. I have one CTEV repair on one side, why do I anesthetize the other leg for it? And complications. Complications do occur in central neuroaxis, not that they don't, and when they occur, they are quite drastic. Now that we're talking about the complications, this is one beautiful study that was done, and I think a peripheral nerve block lecture cannot be completed without this reference. They found that the complications were more in the central neuroaxis. The peripheral nerve blocks had least amount of complications, and when they occurred, they were not life-threatening at least. Well, this is another study who said the same. But let me tell you, there are certain, cert certain uh, cases where you can't just two central neuroaxis blocks. If possible in the severely kyphoscoliotic child, I would rather have a peripheral nerve block in place if the surgery is of that kind. Secondly, if you are a pediatric orthopedic uh, person, a pediatric orthopedic anesthesiologist who does at least one dedicated good list of pediatric orthopedic surgery, you are going to often come across such cases such as osteogenesis imperfecta. Just flipping the child alone might cause an injury here and there. So this was a child who come with recurrent fractures of femurs, the recurrent fractures of most of the limbs because they are the ones which are going to get fractured very, very often. So handling them is an issue. It's very easy to just put a probe and give a femoral nerve block in these kids rather than going to a central neuroaxis block. So this is the necessity of the peripheral nerve blocks today. Having established the necessity of peripheral nerve blocks, what are they in a sense? Is they are in a sense is specifically and peripherally. They target the location of the surgery here. So if, I, if, if the surgeon is operating on the foot, I would precisely go to the popliteal and leave alone the femoral if the tunica is not to be applied. So it's something as precise as that. This was beautifully thought of way back in this particular article. The slide is busy. I know it is busy. I want it to be busy because these are the number of blocks that can be performed in a child or even in a neonate. Everything that can be done in an adult can be done in children, even neonates if need be. You just have to have a lot of experience doing that. Coming to penile surgeries, day-to-day -day work, it can be from religious to pathological. It's, it, it's everyday work. You may just leave the caudal block alone and you might go to something more simpler such as a dorsal penile block. So it's, uh, it, it, it is just two injections, one at 11 o'clock, another at 1 o'clock, in a space in between the pubic symphysis and the shaft of the penis. It's pulled down to give this kind of an injection. Secondly, even simpler, ring block. If you see the syringe getting aspirated, the anesthesiologist has done it. If they don't aspirate, it's a surgeon who's doing a ring block. So it's as simple as that. If you do a dorsal penile block, yes, do infiltrate on the ventral aspect because the glands get sped out here. 
Pudental nerve block and caudal block were compared for hypospediasis surgery, and they did claim that the pudental nerve block gave a, gave a longer lasting analgesia in these cases. This is the literature that supports the peripheral blocks as far as the penile surgeries go. Coming to the paravertebral blocks, they have come even in vogue even more when it comes to thoracic surgeries, kidney surgeries, and even her day-to-day -day hernias. As far as you know that you want one side anesthesia of the trunk, you are, the, the choice of the block is paravertebral. But in kids, most of the times, the surgeon is also going to open the thorax for decortications or put scopes in the thorax for decortications or some infective pathology, infective lobes. This is not the block at that time because it might pave way for the infection to go in the subarachnoid space or in an epidural space for that matter. So it's a clear-cut block for clean, clear-cut surgeries. And it's a great block because it's very simple to give and it acts wonderfully. I would love to have gone in the details of this, but I guess the time is clicking. Anybody who has really got inspired with pediatric regional anesthesia, I invite you for the workshop tomorrow, even now. Well, so this is it. Paravertebral nerve blocks can be, or rather paravertebral block can also be aided with a peripheral nerve stimulator here. This is a kidney case. Right, so you get the stimulation of that particular dermatome and go ahead. Paravertebral blocks were also aided by the formulas that were invented by Dr. Longquist here. It is an age-old formula, works very well if you don't have ultrasound. What about Indian kids? Well, we had worked upon Indian kids and we found out a formula which is eco-guided. In this sense, we measured all the possible measurements that can be taken with ultrasound. And then we came up with this particular formula, works in our practice well. You're most welcome to try it in your clinical work and see if it works for you too. Coming to lumbar plexus. Lumbar plexus can also be done as a dual modality. Perhaps this is the only block I would do with dual modality because ultrasound is going to show you everything other than the lumbar plexus as such. Not as precisely as you would see some other nerve such as a sciatic or maybe any other nerve, even femoral. It's not going to be seen as well as this. So lumbar plexus can be done quite well out here. I'm using an in-plane approach, even an outer plane approach can be used. You saw the demonstration in the morning. The needle trajectory is almost the same, the way in which Dr. Karmakar had shown. These are the twitches that you really see, the same twitches that you would see for the femoral nerve block. So this is what a lumbar plexus block is all about. This is, the, this, this is a beautiful article written on lumbar plexus block. Now, where all is it indicated? A good indication is congenital dislocation of hips, but then there is some part of the hip joint which is supplied by a sciatic. So accept that or then do a sciatic at a very higher level to compensate for it. So it might be a bit inadequate here. It's a good block for fractured femurs though. The limitation is if you go a little too medial, you are going to get an epidural spread as well. And the very principle by which you went away from the central neuroaxis gets defeated. In fact, if you have given, if you ever give this with ultrasound, and if you, if, if you really get the needle right beneath the transverse process, you might see the dural sag. I have seen it many times. So it's, it, it is very, very possible to reach in the epidural space with this approach. Any clues as to what uh, block am I going to cover now? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So we're going to work on trunk blocks, but many a times kids can come with this kind of a trunk. So the role of ultrasound. There are certain blocks which are recruited and revisited due to ultrasound application. So this is one of them. This is spoon belly anyway, but you have to have different kind of uh, tummies here to handle. Usually the tummies here are very, very supple to really get the clicks and the gifts which a fascia usually gives. So you also have tummies like this at that time better go to the central neuroaxis. So let's come to the simple ones, the ileo-inguinal and the ileo-hypogastric. How much time do I have, sir? Almost, oh, huh? almost done? Oh, OK. So ileo-inguinal, ileo-hypogastric, these were all the videos that I would have loved to show you. Um, maybe if you still want to see, catch me somewhere else. 
So these are the references for it. This was, the, this was a traditional approach to give a rectus sheath block. Laparoscopic surgeries are in vogue. These are the surgery, these are the blocks that now hence are in vogue. But please remember one thing, these are only somatic blocks. The visceral pain is never covered by them. So this, this was the rectus sheath block, the tap blocks. And as I told you, the list is endless. Not endless, but at least as same as adults. This was our team. We were do a lot of laparoscopic work here. Continuous abdominal blocks is a possibility. A real, real possibility. Ultrasound guided trunk blocks, as I told you, are all over the place in this literature. So, this is what it is like. Intercostal nerve blocks, yes. Now, lower extremities. Lower extremities, again, pediatric ortho work, lots of lower extremity uh, disabilities. Look at this limp. But let me tell you the analgesia that an epidural gives and an analgesia that a continuous sciatic nerve block is going to give is way different. The quality of a sciatic nerve block analgesia is far more superior than the quality of an epidural analgesia, in fact. So the sciatic catheters, yes, pick up a probe and you don't need anything else other than a simple two he needle and the catheter walking through it to work. So this is absolutely feasible. This is beautifully done. Yes, those people, are, I mean, the orthopedic surgeons might love to put a tunique, supplement it with a femoral block. They are going to tie a nice, maybe, post-op plaster around your catheter. Let them go ahead. In fact, it fixes your catheter even better. After three days, go and pull it out the catheter yourself or send somebody from your own team. So this is, this, is a, this is a really satisfying work that you can do in pediatric population. These are continuous femoral catheters, fascia, iliac blocks. The list is too much. The, the, the upper extremity blocks, well, there is, uh, there is nothing that can't be done, but the only, all the other indications you know, but one indication that I want all of you to take care, or rather remember, is this. If you have a busy NICU, you are going to get ischemic hands. And ischemic hands can be beautifully treated by continuous intraclavicular catheters. You almost can nullify a fasciectomy or you can almost nullify amputations because they are going to get, go towards amputations. So these are the pos all possible upper extremity blocks, the catheters that can be kept here and all the possible work. So this is the latest that we had done in our group where we had really investigated the possibility of keeping ultrasound catheters solely under ultrasound for infraclaviculars and then we saw to it, we just did a die spread and see, saw whether we can really achieve it with perfection and we, I guess we proved our hypothesis. Not always regional is going to save you or sail you through. You are going to get certain cases like this. She had abscesses all over her body. She would always breathe in pain, and this is how it was. So you have to also know a lot of multimodality to take care of your children in the wards. Well, so I sum up saying this. I am a child, and I cannot sleep. Instead, I am staring at the sky because I am in pain. Someone tell me why. Keep me away from this torture. It's hurting me. Am I meant to be in pain? Am I meant to be? Please give attention to your pediatric population. Adults are going to howl at you. Adults are going to, uh, uh, adults are going to complain. Pediatric people, they will just cry. Maybe the mother might understand why they are crying, but they will probably cry. Very, very small kids. They are not going to tell you that, look, doctor, I am hurting. So please do uh, hone your skills in pediatric regional anesthesia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vushali. It's a very nice presentation. I would say that while we are talking about pain, it's also important to know how to assess pain. So I think that's a very important part of pain management. And uh, um, if we do that, then we can do it more effectively. Uh, we have the questions I'm told by the organizers that we can do it at the end of the session. So I would request Dr. Vushali to please be here so that we can have questions in the end. Invite Dr. Rani Sundar now, who is going to speak on fascia iliaca catheters, easy access to the lumbar plexus. Dr. Rani, she's from Gurgaon. Um, uh, good morning. So um, let me get straight to the topic. Fascia iliaca uh, blocks 
are really old blocks. They were described some, uh, sometime in 1980 by Dallins. But in recent times, with uh, the use of ultrasound, the ability to delineate facial planes, the ability to visualize the tracking up of the drugs and following the catheters up, there has been a resurgence of interest and publications in the fascia iliaca uh, blocks and the catheter technique. And I have been uh, really uh, grateful for uh, knowing this technique. And I will describe to you a couple of cases in which this was an invaluable block. Har Simran this morning would have talked about uh, the fascia iliaca block, so I would not go into details of the block. But uh, a few salient anatomical um, considerations to reiterate here. So uh, when we deposit drug in the fascia iliaca plane, we are hoping to uh, you know, uh, move the drug towards the lumbar plexus. So we would get the femoral, the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, the obturator, and thereby cover the uh, thigh and uh, the femur. So this would be useful in surgeries of the proximal distal femur and uh, the hip and soft tissue of uh, the upper leg. Uh, again, this is a plain block, so you have to remember that the volumes are going to be large, and this is a concern for us in the pediatric age group. Uh, another point is that it may not be uh, good as a sole analgesic, perioperative analgesic technique. You may have to supply, uh, supplement with uh, other analgesics, but it, it is a really good technique for postoperative uh, pain management. Another point I would really like to bring your attention to is that if you see here that the dermatomes, the myotomes, and the osteotomes really do not correspond. So when, uh, you, uh, when you are ready to an, uh, use this uh, technique for perioperative analgesia, you should be aware of where the incision is going to be, where the pins are going to be, and where the uh, you know, osteotomies are going to be. Recently when I worked with a child who underwent a proximal femoral osteotomy and the surgeon encroached upon to the sciatic area, as you can see in the femur, even in the proximal femur and the neck, there is a sciatic supply. Analgesia in the perioperative period was not really good quality and I had to add a PCA with fentanyl. Again, um, the sono anatomy, Harsimran would have talked about it. Just a couple of points that I want to bring out here. Uh, Dallins first described the paravascular uh, uh, technique in which he identified the femoral nerve under the uh, fascia iliaca. The bright line there is the fascia lata there. and. Uh, Right, uh, so we did talk, uh, Harsimran talked about the technique, so I would just go ahead and point out that in, the, in Dallin's technique, uh, the drug was deposited in the lateral two-thirds of, you know, the junction between the medial two-thirds and the lateral one-third of the inguinal ligament. He identi uh, you identify the iliacus muscle, that is the dark shadow you see under the um, fascia iliaca and you deposit the drug there. The disadvantage with this technique is that you really do not ascend as high up towards the lumbar plexus as you would desire and there are uh, in about nine, uh, around 1999 there was a paper on uh, supra inguinal approaches to uh, the fascia iliaca and that is what I uh, typically do. So I would identify the facial nerve travel laterally, identify the sartorius, turn my probe towards the umbilicus. So inferiorly, I have the sartorius in view. Superiorly, I have the internal oblique, like you see in the second uh, slide out there. And um, uh, then would I identify the fascia iliaca and deposit the drug there. Is there a pointer around here? So there is a video I would like to show to you and if I could get the cursor to move towards the video. Right, so see, uh, the cursor moved. Right, it did. So, uh, yeah, thank you. So this picture here, the last slide, again it is stuck, it's not moving. I think I'm loud enough, yeah. So the, the slide on the, the left corner of the screen. Yeah, well, I'll you. So here uh, you see this is uh, the sartorius here. This is the iliacus. This is the internal oblique. That is uh, the needle which pops in through the sartorius. I identify the fascia iliaca, pop through the fascia iliaca, and then we go ahead and deposit the drug. Thank you. 
चले गए मम्मा को बताना पड़े कौन सा वीडियो पता है मुझे प्रेजेंटेशन टू नो नॉट दैट मूवी गो बैक टू दैट प्रेजेंट so uh well uh, i'll go ahead and uh, we'll try and open the video for you sometime later but khula hua hai khula yeah yeah that icon chennai okay. chale nahi chal raha you really do not see this lens forming that is what i wanted to highlight uh, in that video that i was going to show you with the catheter going up uh, into the iliac fossa so uh, reviewing literature uh, like i first told you that uh, fascia iliaca compartment block was described in the pediatric population by dalens in 1989 this was a concerted if effort after he did a number of cadaver dissections of the pediatric pelvis and he hypothesized that if you deposit drug under the fascia iliaca it should travel up towards the lumbar plexus and in a very beautiful manner he compared it to a, a peripheral nerve stimulator guided femoral block which in which he give volumes which is typically described for a 3 in 1 in 1 block and he did apply digital pressure and if you see the results out there the lateral cutaneous nerve coverage and the obturator nerve, nerve coverage is far superior to uh, the the uh, femoral 3 in 1 block Uh, so this was a beautiful article seven page article and thereafter fascia iliaca compartment blocks became a, a tool which uh, most anesthesiologists used both in the pediatric and the adult world it was a block for uh, trauma patients with fa fracture femurs it was used for post operative analgesia and with uh, the advent of the ultrasound especially in the last year there has been a lot of literature on the fascia iliaca uh, compartment block Uh, so this uh, this uh, impetus to this literature was started by one paper that was published by Shariat and Hadzik in RAPM in June 2013 in which they studied fascia iliaca block as a rescue after hip arthroplasties and they said it did not provide any advantage over the placebo and if you see the four or five papers that i have uh, you know put on this slide Uh, at least uh, you know 10 pay, 10 letters to the editors came in response to this article in which this article was criticized both for methodology and the technique used uh, that critique for the technique was largely that he used a paravascular technique which is not a really good way to uh, have the drug ascend towards the lumbar plexus and um, all the authors who did uh, critique this uh, paper used the supraguinal approach and uh, uh, if you see the uh, the third slide uh, the picture out there you see the uh, the typical um, hourglass picture that harsimran would have described to you or it's also called a bow tie uh, picture that you see in which you place the probe uh, above the inguinal ligament and identify this typical hourglass pattern and deposit the drug under the hourglass right here in the iliacus above the iliacus under the fascia iliaca uh, again the pediatric literature we do have a lot of papers uh, talking about the fascia iliaca block there is a review in uh, the cochrane database from 2013 december in which 55 uh, trials were studied and they concluded that it is a very good technique for um, pain management of uh, femoral fractures again a chinese paper talked about using this as a technique for analgesia for salter harris arthroplasty treatment i would not use this because uh, you know when they do salter harris uh, osteotomies the surgeon works around it, it, it does a pelvic osteotomy and he reflects the iliacus off it is technically very difficult to do this block unless the surgeon places the catheter there for you again in a recent paper in 2011 in pediatric anesthesia the uh, this uh, um, three cases were described one of the children had uh, very low platelet counts 
and the other two had technical difficulties for neuraxial approach and this was an excellent method for both uh, perioperative, uh, intraoperative and postoperative analgesia. So, well, we are always, as pediatric anesthesiologists, we are always concerned about uh, drug dosages. Dallin's used a volume, volume of 0.7 mils per kilo. Oliver Pott from a French man who published very impartially first in an American journal and then in a British journal studied uh, quarter percent bupivacaine and then 0.2 percent ropivacaine and 0.375 percent ropivacaine and in both his papers he said that with this volumes you do achieve supranormal blood levels of the local anesthetic. Miller, in the three cases uh, that he described, used 0.2% uh, ropivacaine with a dose of 0.12 to 0.16 milligram per kg. None of these authors had any problems with um, neurological um, side effects, but they caution against the large volumes used. Adjuvants are certainly in vogue. There are no, no large trials describing it. I'm partial to clonidine, and I use it quite extensively. So this is a case that I took care of and which, which I was grateful for knowing this technique. Uh, the child pretty much looked like the uh, slide that Vrishali put up. He was a 14 year old who weighed 14 kilos. This is his chest x-ray and there you see his limbs. I agonized over it for a week. We did a CT reconstruction of the spine. I did a call, brought him down to the OR, looked at the spine with the ultrasound thought of doing a caudal, but then finally we settled for uh, fascia iliaca catheters. It was challenging for me to decide what kind of infusions to give to this child, but um, uh, he weighing, that he weighed 14 kilos, I, would, I did a bolus of 14 mils of 0.2% for each hip, and we did supplement with some fentanyl, uh, and it was a six-hour procedure. The child got extubated uneventfully and did very well postoperatively. So the other conditions I've recently used this technique was in conditions which preclude the use of neuraxial blocks. Uh, Glanzman thrombasthenia, the child came for a proximal femoral osteotomy. It's a condition in which there is a clotting defect and you cannot do any uh, neuraxial um, blocks. The first time this child came, I used a PCA. When she came for a redo hip, we used fascia iliaca. Achondroplastics, we have concern about spinal canal stenosis and difficult blocks have had a couple of teenagers who refused neuraxial blocks. It is my routine for all unilateral femoral osteotomies, femoral plate removals and bilateral eight plates, which, uh, you know, when children have femoral uh, defects, bilateral eight plates are done in the distal femur. That is where I use this pretty frequently. So to conclude, uh, fascia iliaca catheter uh, compartment blocks and catheter uh, techniques is a useful technique for a pediatric regionalist. It is a useful technique for unilateral procedures of the thigh and the femur for perioperative analgesia. Mm -hmm. And uh, further studies are required to revisit bolus and infusion volumes, especially with the advent of high-definition ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia techniques. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can uh, allow a couple of questions now to the two speakers that we had. Very interesting topics, so I'm sure there'll be some questions. Uh, if there isn't, uh, can I please ask you, Dr. Brushali, um, about um, uh, peripheral nerve blocks. Of course, Dr. Senthil has gone. I had a question for him, too. You can, I can ask you. Yeah. So, uh, do you, uh, what adjuvants do you normally use? Rani said that she's partial to clonidine. I am too. Um, Dexmedetomidine is still not approved for, uh, in, in children or in adults, I think, uh, for nerve blocks. Um, so, which adjuvant would you use in caudal catheters or in... Uh, when it comes to catheters, mm -hmm. adjuvants may not be used mm -hmm. because the prolongation purpose okay. is done by okay. the catheter okay. itself. Yes, clonidine is the choice of adjuvants that even I use. Dexmeditomidine, I know it isn't approved. Please don't quote me. I do put it at times. <laughs> yes. No, it's okay. I think it's published in, in some remote yes. uh, fact, Egyptian it, journal or yes. something. It is and there. And there was one very beautiful uh, paper that was presented right here on Dex on one mm. side and clonidine on another yeah. in our uh, free papers. Mm. The crux is the dosage, I think. Yes. Yes. The dosages are three described, 0.51, and somebody's gone to two. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, any specific precautions while using the infusion pumps in cotton catheters or apple catheters? Or any special infusion pump do you use so as uh, to maintain the safety and... Uh, well, uh, this, is, this is one question that needs to be thought of and answered all the time to yourselves when you leave a catheter in a baby and go home. I, we have had incidences, I will repeat, we have had bad incidences of people putting epidural uh, catheters after a refill right in the IV. Luckily, it has been picked up and rectified, but this happens. I, I invite everybody to learn from the errors that we have seen. Well, I usually use an infusion pump, which is very straightforward. And the infusion pump has a huge label in red with the name and the dosages. And then above over it, there is a big file on which uh, it's a, uh, you know, the entire thing is written, along with the boluses if required in between, and hung on the child's bed. And who will handle it in your absence? Do you uh, write that also? Uh, luckily, the resident on call oh, looks know. after that. And there are clear instructions. Yes, on that and because... usually kids are in PICU. Yeah, okay. right. Thank you. She wanted to ask somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Rani want to yeah. speak something No, about. I think we here use a lot of syringe pump for doing yeah. epidural infusion okay. that really increases the risk mm. of uh, epidural catheters for yeah. children, especially on the floors. Mm. So as far as possible, if we could you change over to, if it is economically feasible, to yeah. pumps that you... So Lock what I it. normally do is, no, they're lockable mm. and also uh, they have codes. Mm. I fill in, uh, I expect to keep a catheter for two days, so I choose a bag which fills in that entire mm. volume. Yeah. And uh, again, like she said, labeling is very important, and uh, so there is no tampering. Yeah. So yeah. I think syringe pumps are risky. That's the main concern. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to ask Rani if you could just describe your technique, uh, if we have time for putting in the fascia. Oh, like. It's like you do a femoral nerve block. You start to identify the femoral artery. You so you see a sharp right line. If I can have that slide back on, I so the sharp right line you see is the fascia lata mm. and just below that you see a second sharp line which is not as sharp as the lata that's the iliac and below that you see the femoral nerve so when it's people did it blind all the time so you felt two pops i'm not good with feeling those pops so then you move your transducer in the transverse plane more laterally keep following that uh, fascia iliac so you will see the iliacus. They almost come muscle. together, it's, the yeah. facial lata and the yeah. iliaca. Below that the is the iliacus, 